Hello. Hi. Uh, um, is this on? Yes. Uh, Feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point. Et si vous voulez uh, poser mes questions en français, ça va aussi. Hi. As I was introduced, I work at uh, NASA. We have a, a lab just on the other side of campus. And um, we work mainly in uh, climate modeling. So we're trying to put together everything that we understand about all the different processes that are going on in order to understand the emergent behavior of the climate and then predict perhaps what's going to happen uh, to it. And I'm going to sp speak mainly about uh, the new developments in climate modeling uh, that I think make climate modeling much more interesting uh, for stakeholders like yourself or for policymakers uh, who have very specific questions that you might want to ask about the climate or about policy or about vulnerabilities uh, that up until now uh, people weren't really able to help you uh, give that, uh, work out that answer. So um, you can think of this as, as kind of couples therapy for, for the marriage between science and policy. And we, we work very much at that interface, right? So trying to... Well, you know what? Let me stand over here. That's fine. Um, we, we work in a field where there's a lot of interest in that field outside of the scientific community. Um, there would be a lot of interest in it, I think, just generally because it's a fascinating subject. Uh, but it's become much more salient to policymakers, to, uh, to stakeholders. And, and so we find ourselves thrust into a policy science uh, Mille, uh, which, which can be very awkward at times. Um, and I think historically, I think it's safe to say uh, that that hasn't always been handled very well. Uh, and trying to come up with new ways to improve that dialogue, that process, uh, is really what I'm going to try and focus on here. Um, there's a fundamental disconnect. Uh, basically, <laughs> scientists <laughs> speak in a very different language than policymakers. We're very reductionist. We're very, okay, let's break it down into smaller and smaller components. Uh, whereas the questions that are being asked of us are much more holistic. They're much larger scale. They're much more complex. And we have historically not answered those questions in, in, that, in that same thing. We've, we've, we've responded to holistic questions like what's going to happen with specific reductionist statements about concentrations of carbon dioxide or, or methane or aerosols and things like that. Uh, and, and so we, we have a, a fundamental kind of disconnect that uh, more and more people in the scientific end, and I think more and more people on the policy end, are, are realizing uh, uh, can be bridged. Uh, and I'll loop back at the end with some kind of suggestions for how, how, we, can, how we can bridge that. So what are the fundamental issues? Okay, so we're talking the same language, we're talking about climate, we're talking about policy, we're talking about uh, emissions, uh, but things are framed very differently from the scientific end as from the policymaker end or the stakeholder end. Um, we're very focused on individual processes, individual constituents. People spend their entire lives trying to work out you know, the, the, um, uh, the properties and, uh, and impacts of a single molecule. Right? I mean, so the, you know, those, are, those, are, those are very reductions, and that's, and that's the way we make progress. Um, but, but this is not necessarily the most relevant thing for policymakers or stakeholders. You know, you want to know what is this action going to do? What is what should should I do a different action? Should I? What what are the consequences of anything I do? Um, we're often very single issue, um, whereas you know policymakers have to multitask. You know, uh, somebody described uh, being in Congress uh, as being. Uh, forced to sit in front of a, a, a TV channel with 500 different channels and somebody else is turning the channel every five minutes. Right? So that doesn't, that doesn't work for us. So obviously policymakers are interested in, in lots of other things, not just climate, in air quality, in pollution, in public health, in agricultural yield, in power generation, in you know, the safety of their people. It, all of these things are linked in the policymakers' mind and often in the scientists' mind they're completely separate. Okay, so. We, we set up a, a process um, along with governments, uh, but, but mainly th that is run by scientists, uh, called the IPCC, that was supposed to deal with this. 
right? They were supposed to be the one-stop shop that would allow science to feed into an assessment process which would then be used by uh, the rest of the world. But the, but the problem is, is not really with the IPCC. The IPCC does very good science and, and, it's, and it does a very good job of what it does, uh, but, but it doesn't quite do the right job that's actually required. Um, and, and mainly that's because the IPCC is an assessment of the science by the scientists for the scientists. Right? And if you've ever read any of the chapters, and maybe you've only read the summaries, but if you actually dive into the chapters, uh, you'll see that, that they're not answering big questions. They're talking about the science in the way that we frame uh, the science as scientists. I'll give you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend my time shooting at the IBCC. Uh, they, they, get, they get far too much. Um, familiar with the acronym IBCC. Le GIC, le, 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 le gouvernement, uh, yeah. Governmental, environmental, environmental intergovernment, but GEIC, I'm not quite sure. But it's, it's in English, it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, but it's, uh, it's the group, uh, well, Group International pour l'Environnement et Climat. All right, it's the stuff. Okay, I should, I should have put a little thing there. Um, I'm, I'm not going to shoot at it. I think they do a great job, and, and they get far too much criticism by, uh, from people that have absolutely no <laughs> idea what they're talking about. So um, I think they do a great job, but they do get shot at. But let me give you an example of what I mean and, and how those different perspectives um, actually end up confusing the issue. So this is, this is a picture uh, that was in the summary for policymakers. Uh, I think it was figure one or figure two. Uh, and what it does is it breaks down all the things that, that have really been going on since about 1750 um, in terms of atmospheric concentrations of, of various things. So the biggest thing, of course, is that carbon dioxide uh, has increased by over 100 ppm. Uh, methane has increased, N2O has increased, uh, halocarbon CFCs have increased. We've been increasing tropospheric ozone because of uh, emissions of, uh, of reactive gases like NOx and uh, carbon monoxide. Um, we've increased stratospheric water vapor. We've increased black carbon. Uh, we've increased uh, aerosols, uh, sulfates, nitrates, organic aerosols. Um, those have a cooling effect, they're blue, all these have a warming effect. And if you add up all of these things, you get a total net human activity, which is uh, very large and very warming. Right? So this is basically you know, why the planet has been warming over the last 100 years. But this is very much a scientific point of view. We've broken up all the things that we can measure. And we've said, okay, well, that's responsible for this amount of uh, radiated forcing. This is responsible for this amount. And then we're just going to add them all up. None of the things on here give you any guidance as to how you might deal with any of these issues. Right? And the reason is, is that anything that you might do affects half a dozen of these all at the same time. Right? A change towards uh, improving uh, mileage standards in cars uh, changes... Uh, Ozone, aerosols, methane, nitrous oxides, and, and carbon dioxide all at the same time. Uh, and is that a good thing to do, or is it a bad thing to do? This, this kind of information doesn't help you at all. So this is, this is very much the scientist's eye view of what's happened uh, so far. Um, the key thing is that different forcings are linked, and they're linked differently in different regions. So the linkage between emissions from cars and power stations and smog and climate and public health in China is different to what it is in Eastern Europe because the, the mix of emissions is different, the, um, the fingerprint of the technology is different, and, in, and it's different again in India where you have a lot of biomass burning for domestic uh, burning of uh, uh, domestic cooking and, and things like that. So we have to start taking that into account. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate models, and I'm going to try and give you a sense for how they are useful or, or if they are useful. Um, and so uh, I'll start off with, with some things that I think that they are useful for, and I'll come back to uh, the things that I don't think they're useful for. I think models, um, as they exist now, are really good at helping us quantify the impacts of various policy choices. Now, historically, we haven't done a lot of this kind of work, but this is the kind of work the models should be doing. Um, instead of spending time worrying about what any single factor does, like methane, what does methane do? Uh, we should be thinking about 
what does this process that we're engaged in, what does fracking do? Right? It, 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 it causes emissions of carbon dioxide, but also there's leakage of, of methane through the process. That methane oxidizes, sets up a, a cycle, adds to ozone, which is a controlled substance under the EPA. It changes the mix of energy. It changes where pollutants are being em emitted. And so there are uh, consequences to actions that we can quantify that aren't just what does any one component of the atmosphere do. It's what does any one action do. Um, we can link air quality concerns and climate concerns uh, much more easily now. The components that have been put into uh, climate models include atmospheric chemistry, aerosols, different emissions of, of many different species. Uh, right now, our, our Earth system models uh, keep track of something like 200 chemical reactions, 60 or so different species in the atmosphere, which is a huge expansion in what we were doing even five years ago. Um, and they can tell us something about where we're going to need to adapt, where, where, where we're going to have vulnerabilities. Now, this is, uh, you know, people who make global models aren't always very clear about what the vulnerability is at some locality or some regional uh, area because, you know, we don't live there and we don't really have much information. But with, with con in conjunction with an assessment of those local vulnerabilities, we can ask questions of the models that might give us statistical um, ideas about how the events that give rise to those vulnerabilities in one region or another uh, might be changing over time. And those are very specific to different localities. Uh, Texas is very, uh, right now, it's very clear, it's very susceptible to drought, right? New York State, not so much. New York State, the problems are more related to flooding or sea level rise. You know, looking at what events cause problems in different regions is very much a, uh, a, a, a discussion that has to be had with the people who understand uh, how climate and weather impacts any particular region. And we can try and assess the impact of known unknowns, right? Things that we know are uncertain, where we've got, you know, a parameter, but we know that we haven't been able to constrain it very well. We can test what difference that makes if we change it or we make it bigger or make it smaller. Or we include a process that we know might be important or, 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 or might not. Um, all of those things can be done with the models as they exist now. So what can't models do? Okay, so models can't give you perfect long-term or short-term predictions. Right? If, if, if that was something that you thought models could do for you and it'll tell you exactly what's going to happen in your location at any particular time or season, okay. That's, uh, that's an impossibility. Uh, there's a certain amount of uncertainty that's completely irreducible. Partly that's scenario uncertainty, which obviously increases as you go forward, you know, exactly how economies are going to develop, how technology is going to develop, how emissions are going to develop. You know, we, can, we can draw some lines and we make some scenarios, but we don't know what is actually going to happen by 2100 or tw even 2050. Um, there's irreducible uncertainty associated with the chaotic nature of weather. Right, so, you know, we can have reasonable weather forecasts of specific storms, you know, five days, seven days out. Uh, but the idea that we could tell you exactly what's going to happen, you know, July 31st, 2014, is, um, uh, is, is, is obviously uh, beyond us, or beyond everybody. It's not a question, it's not our skill that's lacking, it's just a, a fundamental characteristic of the system. Um, models can't solve political issues, right? If there are going to be winners and losers, if there are going to be costs and benefits, that's what the political process is there to balance, right? Models can't tell you what's worth doing and what's not worth doing, right? So we have to uh, make sure that the, that the information that we give doesn't pretend that these issues are part of our algorithm. They're not, right? Costs and benefits and values, they have to be explicitly talked about within the political context and that has to be a, a much wider decision, a much wider um, discussion uh, than just between the scientists and, and, the, uh, and the people in power. Um, and then going down to really, really, really small scales, kind of sub-100 kilometers, uh, models are a long way from being able to give you detailed information at that scale. Right? There are some things that you can that you can say at local levels. There are some things that you can kind of infer 
uh, but, but really knowing exactly what's going to happen in one particular location, you know, where you have a power station, where you have a city, uh, that is somewhat tricky. And they can't tell you what the unknown unknowns are. They can't tell you that we've missed something crucial out about the system that nobody's actually studied or seen yet. Right? Then they're not they're not magic. You know, they only uh, respond to the assumptions that we build into them. And so, if there's new physics, uh, if there's uh, something new that is going to happen in our new warmer planet, um, it's unclear that the models will be able to tell you. So, I think what's inevitable is that the models are conservative with a small c. They will not include surprises that I'm pretty confident we will have uh, over the next 50 years. And I'll give you an example of, of when that, did that, that was exactly the case. Uh, the polar ozone hole over Antarctica, and, and very recently over the Arctic, uh, was not predicted ahead of time uh, by anybody. Uh, instead, the, uh, the models that were looking at ozone depletion back in the early 80s uh, showed uh, a pretty st steady decrease in, in ozone to the extent that people were already worried and they were already talking about uh, the Montreal Protocol. Um, but they didn't include the chemistry that happens in the polar vortex when it gets really cold and you form these little particles and there's a whole new set of chemistry that occurs on these small particles because they'd never been observed. Right? And that set up the ozone hole uh, and led to uh, 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 a, a great realization that you know, models are, are not crystal balls. They can only tell you what you've put in and what you've already uh, seen. So what we're trying to do is, is something that is actually very ambitious, intellectually ambitious. What we're trying to do is, is just from a, a, a knowledge of all the small-scale processes that are going on, the chemistry that's, that's going on around us, uh, how clouds form, how water evaporates from the ocean, how the winds push the ocean currents around, how soil moisture evaporates, uh, all of these things, we can go and measure them, we can, we can kind of quantify them, and then we're going to put them all together and we're trying to predict how the whole system evolves, just from, just from knowledge of the smallest scales. And it's not obvious that that is possible, uh, but uh, it does turn out to be uh, reasonably uh, doable. And so we're trying to predict you know, the climatology. Why do we have the seasonal cycle that we do? What, what, what controls the magnitude of those variations? We're trying to predict all of those things just from looking at all those different processes. And then we're trying to understand the variability of that system. right? Again, that variability is intrinsic to the system. It's an emergent property of the, of the system, but it isn't something that's a priori predictable just from you know, knowing that water evaporates from the ocean. That doesn't tell you what the magnitude of, of different storm systems is going to be in the northern latitudes, for instance. And if that was just all that we were doing, I think that would be a very interesting intellectual exercise. Um, we'd have lots of people interested in it because it's so complex. Uh, but that's not really why we're being funded. We're being funded... <laughs> Uh, because we humans are kicking this system extremely hard. Um, and uh, this, for the Americans in the audience, this isn't a democratic donkey, it's a it's kind of generic uh, donkey. Um, that's the symbol for the Democratic Party, but it's, it's a very bipartisan thing, so we're all, we're all doing this. Um, and we're kicking this system, and we really want to know what's going to happen. We want to know what's in the box. What's the response of this system going to be to the big kick that we're giving it? So the kind of processes that we include, I gave a, a brief rundown earlier on. Um, the, you know, the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere, interactions in clouds, um, the interactions between the land and the atmosphere, sea ice changes, changes in the ocean. This is the kind of stuff, uh, these, these kind of green things, this is the kind of stuff that was in climate models, say, 10 years ago, right? And so we've, we've matured uh, as, as a science, as a field, uh, to the point where we've got a pretty good idea about what these things are doing. Uh, and then we'd ask questions. Well, you know, what if we change the, the power of the sun? You know, there's an 11-year solar cycle. You know, what, does, what, what impact does that have? What impact do the big volcanoes have on the, on the system? Uh, what impact do, do human influences on carbon dioxide and things have on the system? We could ask those questions. Um, but what's happened over the last five uh, or so years is that we've added far more complexity to this. We've added cycles that control uh, methane and the carbon cycle and aerosols and atmospheric chemistry. Uh, we're putting in uh, the, the response of ice sheets and glaciers to changes. 
we're, we're thinking about vegetation in a much more sophisticated way than we were doing before. And this has made the models far more complete and, and, and it's expanded enormously the range of questions that we can pose to the models. So uh, some of the key atmospheric chemistry things, um, you, you probably are aware of this, I'm not gonna go through all of this. Uh, basically, you've got, you've, got, you've got a cycle here uh, which generates ozone, O3, uh, which is the main, uh, main air pollutant that, that, that people worry about. Um, and that's driven, this cycling is driven by surface emissions of NOx coming from uh, internal combustion engines mainly, um, but also emissions of uh, methane from, for instance, um, uh, gas, uh, gas works and uh, landfills and, uh, uh, and uh, agricultural activity. Uh, but also, uh, you, could, you know, you could put in here changes in, in carbon monoxide. All of these things make this cycle faster and increase the amount of ozone that's available. And so we've got a, a direct connections between surface emissions of, of greenhouse gases like methane and surface emissions of pollutants to other greenhouse gases. We don't actually emit ozone, it's just something that, that emerges in the atmosphere. Uh, that's also, that's, that's both a greenhouse gas and a pollutant. Um, and that in itself has an impact on how sulfur dioxide gets changed to sulfate aerosols. Uh, so this, this is a big component of acid rain, of course, uh, as well as being a reflective component of the atmosphere, which is, which is slightly cooling the atmosphere. And of course, that feeds into carbon dioxide. So you can see that, there's, that there are a lot of linkages, and this is not even like a tenth as complicated as we're actually calculating. Um, that, that, make, that make the kind of questions that we're going to ask slightly more interesting. So, um, remember what I showed you at the beginning. Uh, it, it, this is the same graph as, as, as the one from the IPCC, except that I've rotated it 90 degrees. They're very fond of flipping these things around. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but anyway. So this is, this, is, this is the same graph as what I showed you before. This is the carbon dioxide contribution, methane, ozone, sulfate cooling, uh, nitrate cooling, and stratospheric water vapor slightly warming. And instead of, of saying, well, what's in the atmosphere and what impact is it having? Uh, let's ask the question, what are we putting into the atmosphere and what impact is that having? And what you see is that uh, there are uh, big differences. So remember that ozone is not directly emitted. Sulfate is not directly emitted. Nitrate is not directly emitted. Stratospheric water is not directly emitted. Uh, instead, we're emitting carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is pretty much uh, uh, inert chemically, so what you put up is, is what uh, ends up staying there. Uh, but methane is very uh, reactive, and so when you put methane into the atmosphere, you end up with more methane in the atmosphere, but you also end up with more ozone, you also end up with more stratospheric water vapor, and you also end up a with a little less uh, sulfate and a little bit more nitrate. So the net effect of methane, if you think about methane being emitted, as opposed to methane being in the atmosphere already, uh, it kind of doubles the impact of methane in any of these budgets. So this gives you a much better uh, grasp of what it is that one should be doing in order to reduce the abundances of important species in the atmosphere. Um, emissions come from many different places um, and different emissions uh, come from diff have, have different, um, different, different industries have different fingerprints of emissions. So for instance, uh, biofuels, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, produce a lot of carbon monoxide, a little bit of NOx, and, and a fair bit of, of volatile organics, um, but don't produce very much sulfate. Uh, but industry and power uh, produce a lot more sulfate, particularly in Asia, uh, but don't produce very much in the way of carbon monoxide and VOCs, uh, because the combustion that goes on in a power station is much more efficient than the combustion that goes on in a house or in a small uh, industrial environment. So depending on what it is that you're doing and where it is you're doing it, you have a different fingerprint of emissions, and so therefore you're going to have a different impact on uh, air pollution, climate, and the, and the net effects of all of those things. So I'll give you a couple of examples from transportation. Um, if you look at the on-road transport uh, sector, so this is cars, trucks, and trains, um, what you're producing is carbon dioxide from, from the burning of the fossil fuel. Uh, you're producing NOx, you're producing black carbon, uh, which is an aerosol which is absorbing, so that's a warming effect, uh, but it's also particulate matter, so that's a, an important controlled substance 
uh, for uh, environmental purposes. Um, and all of these things are, are emitted at the ground level. They're domestically controlled. And so, you know, it's, it's a very uh, kind of tidy system, if you like. Um, aviation uh, is, 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 is much more of a mess. Uh, carbon dioxide, yes. Nitrous oxide, yes. Sulfur dioxide, yes. Uh, you have got also got contrails and water vapor that's being emitted into the upper troposphere. Um, and this is a very different place from the ground. There's a lot less water. There's a lot, uh, the, the chemistry that goes on in the upper troposphere is different uh, to uh, what happens at the ground. And it's, complete, and it's an international business, right? So controls on aviation uh, and questions about how you might deal with aviation pollutants uh, are very different to questions that you might have related to surface on-road transport. Uh, and shipping is, uh, again, another, uh, uh, another completely separate category. Um, carbon dioxide mainly, uh, but very high uh, sulfur dioxide emissions because of the bunker fuel they use. Um, you have very clear indirect effects. If you look at satellite pictures of um, you know, areas in the, in, the, in the Pacific where there's a lot of ship uh, movement, you'll see clouds following the ship uh, that, that's kind of similar to contrails following um, uh, aeroplanes. Um, and, but this is in the ocean, it's often uh, international waters, it's at the surface and is, is barely controlled at all. So you can ask yourself, well, what if we changed any of those mixes? What if we, what if we were able to take um, the on-road transportation sector? So this is the net forcings from on-road transportation. So this is positive, uh, carbon dioxide, ozone, uh, a little bit of sulfate, but not very much, and a little bit of black carbon. So those are the three main components there. And then you ask, OK, well, uh, what about power generation? Now, this is on a 20-year horizon. So if you, if you took a longer horizon, then carbon dioxide becomes more important. And then these elements here, the, carbon, the um, uh, sulfates and indirect aerosol effects on clouds, uh, they would become smaller in comparison. Uh, but if you actually look at a 20-year horizon, power generation is kind of equal in terms of, of uh, it's, it's near zero in terms of um, uh, radiative forcing. Over a longer term, then this stuff uh, drops out and this becomes a much bigger term. So uh, long term power generation is, is, is a big driver of climate change. Um, in the short term, not so much. Uh, but you can ask yourself, well, what would be the consequence of changing you know, cafe standards or switching to uh, renewable energy or something like that. And we can see what all these different elements would, uh, would do. So uh, let's imagine that, that we could, just by uh, fiat, uh, reduce emissions from online transport by 50%, either by, by mandate or by new technology. Um, what you'd have, uh, if you had a, a zero emission replacement source of energy, uh, that would obviously be the best, you'd have a big decrease in the radiative forcing. So that would be a net cooling and a net reduction of, of air pollution uh, across the board. If you, um, so that's if you did it in the, uh, in the US, if you did it globally, you'd still have a big net reduction in, uh, in emissions and climate forcing. Uh, so that would be a good thing, right? Um, you can see the impact of, of, of temperature changes. So this would be a climate model simulation where we've changed that emission profile by 50% uh, in the different uh, scenarios that we put forward. And you can see that even though you know, this is uh, something, for instance, in this case, we're only doing it in the US, uh, you can see impacts climatically that, that are actually hemispheric. Um, and if you do it globally, uh, then it looks more like the hemispheric bias between southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. And you can see that there's a big uh, kind of global impact of local changes. Um, but you also have these pollutant impacts. So this would be uh, the change in ozone that you would get if you were replacing uh, on-road transport with, with hybrid fleets, for instance, that, that were being powered by renewables. Uh, you'd have a decrease in sulfates. Um, and, if, and this is the case here if you replaced it using the current mix for power generation. And you'd still see uh, net reductions in ozone, but it's a little bit patchier. Uh, but you'd have a big increase in sulfates because uh, current power generation produces a lot of sulfur dioxide, uh, particularly in Asia. And you get a big decrease in, in, in black carbon as well. OK. So a uh, quick summary. Um, you can reduce emissions from surface transportation, uh, and they will give you unambiguous reductions in climate forcing. 
right? That, that's it's one of those win-win scenarios, uh, regardless of the replacement power source. Um, you'd have impacts on sulfates, acid rain, uh, particulate matter, uh, ozone levels, and that impacts um, uh, both public health and agriculture. Um, and you know you can do this in lots of different models, and you, also, and, you and you get pretty much the same answer uh, regardless of what the models. Uh, are or where, or where they come from. Um, so if we take another step back and then we ask ourselves, well, of all the different things that we could tackle, which ones are the ones that are going to give us the biggest bang for the buck? Right. Um, this is a, uh, a selection of different sectors uh, and different regions. Um, so the first three are from uh, North America. So domestic use of energy, so basically that's residential, uh, residential use of energy, uh, service transportation and power and industry. Okay, so that's these first three. Uh, right now, uh, they produce varying levels of, of uh, carbon dioxide. The biggest source of carbon dioxide is, uh, is industry and power. Um, and they produce very different short-lived uh, species impacts. So the, the short-lived species are the aerosols, ozone, uh, black carbon, and, and the like. And so when you put these things together and you ask yourself, okay, well, you know, should you have tackled the things with the biggest carbon dioxide footprint or should you tackle the things which have the biggest net footprint? Okay, the answer is very different. Um, and it's different depending on where you are. The other three here are based on Asian uh, patterns of, of behavior. Uh, so domestic burning, uh, Asian transport, and Asian industry. And what you'll notice is that Asian industry produces a lot more sulfate uh, because it, it's much dirtier. And so if you look at the, the net impacts here and you say, okay, well, if you just looked at the carbon dioxide, you'd have said industry and power were the two big things that you had to tackle. If you actually uh, look at the net impact, what you find is that surface transportation in North America and the domestic burning of uh, biomass or uh, fossil fuel uh, in, in Asia is, is by far the bigger problem. Right? So this would... This would, cons this would give you a different perspective on, the, uh, on which policies you would be, want to be tackling first. Just, just one, one comment here. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, the intensity of CapEx and the possibility to do emergency reduction. Right. So, so, very different. Oh, t totally, totally. So, so this, the 30% reduction, that was just like, OK, well, what, yeah, sh what should we use good. because we do this? Right. So we'll, I'll move to next what's feasible and, and what, what people have actually that the technology exists and it's been properly costed and everything. Just what was the European contribution? Uh, the European contribution looks very much like the North American contribution. Uh, it's the, the, the mix of sources and the emission profiles for different activities is quite similar. Right, so, so it's, it, the question is whether you can have a, a feasible reduction in any of these things. Okay, so I said that already, so I'm just going to skip that. Okay. So very recently, uh, there was a report that was, um, that was commissioned by uh, UNEP uh, to look at uh, feasible reductions in black carbon and ozone uh, via uh, emission, ch uh, emission controls on particulates, on methane, on carbon monoxide, on volatile organics, uh, where they did exactly what you're saying. What is actually feasible in what location uh, using what technology. And so what they did was they took existing technologies that have been deployed uh, already in, in, in various places and said, well, what would happen if we deployed these things uh, more widely? Uh, and they had uh, three groups of measures. Uh, one uh, was uh, just, uh, just controls on methane. Uh, that would be uh, this, this first column in the different pictures. Uh, the second group of measures is the controls on methane and then controls on black carbon. So this is like soot and, and, uh, uh, and organic uh, carbon. Um, and then uh, if you had the, the, the third scenario was if you controlled methane and then you used all of the black carbon reduction uh, technologies that uh, currently exist. And what they tried to do is they tried to go all the way down. So you can say, okay, well, what impact are these things going to have on climate? Right? So we can calculate the climate Forcing from that, we can calculate the temperature changes, rainfall changes, and things like that. Um, and you'll see that the more stuff you do, the bigger impact it had on climate. Okay, well, that's not surprising. Um, but remember that these things also affect ozone. Ozone is one of the key 
are uh, problematic air pollution species for food and for, and for crop yield. Uh, and so if you, uh, you could, this is the annually avoided crop yield losses in millions of tons associated with these measures which are changing ozone uh, as well as changing, uh, as well as reducing climate. And so you can see, you can start to get um, really very large numbers in, in here. So this is, you know, 50 to 100 million tons uh, of, of uh, crop yield losses. Now, what does that cost, right? What, what, what's, what's the, what's the um, uh, what, you know, how, do, how does that uh, translate into, into real dollars? Well, that's a little bit hard, but we can get to that too. Uh, we can also look at human health impacts. Ozone is, is toxic at, uh, at, at actually quite low concentrations. Uh, and is very clearly uh, affected, uh, uh, affects uh, human health. And so as you start uh, decreasing the amount of ozone, decreasing the amount of black carbon, uh, you, e you end up with um, estimates of uh, annually avoided premature deaths in the millions of lives. Okay, and then you can say, okay, well, just these little, one, these, these little things that we can actually count, uh, what would be the, the, the benefit of that? What would be the, the cost savings in that? And you end up very, very easily uh, with numbers in the, uh, the two to five uh, trillion dollar range, right? And this is far more than any of the abatement uh, mechanisms would actually cost. So, what, what is UNEP, again? UNEP is the United Nations Environmental Program. So, uh, if you, I gave this as one of the, the links to read, and, and I, I, I really recommend it because it's, um, it's an assessment that is far more tied towards policymakers and stakeholders than any previous climate assessment has been. Because they, did, they, they answered the questions that real policymakers are answering, as opposed to answering the questions that scientists think policymakers are answering. So, um, okay. Um, so how, how, how do we go forward with this kind of thing? I think that the biggest thing that we've learned in, in producing these assessments uh, and, and in demonstrating uh, to people what these models can do uh, is that we really need to spend a lot of time listening to what the other people are asking and, and thinking about what it is they're really asking. Uh, because often the questions are, 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 are malformed and we kind of interpret them in our own way and we answer the questions that we thought you should have asked. Okay, but that, that's, we need to spend more time listening. There's no escape from the complexity of the system. I think this is a very important point. Right? The system is complicated. Air pollution and climate change and public health, all of these things are linked. Right? So you know, we can try and kind of you know, separate out uh, you know, red. We can try and separate out Kyoto. We can try and separate out black carbon. But, but in the end, that's, that's not sensible because we have to decide on specific actions. And any action that we take has impacts on all of these different things. Uh, climate change is a problem that infects all other problems because we rely implicitly to a, to a large extent on assumptions about static climate in a, in a statistical sense uh, for, for many, many different things. Where we grow our crops, how we grow our crops, where we build buildings, you know, how close to the shore we go, how close to the river we go. Uh, whether, you know, I mean, you have a lot of power stations on rivers that are affected by changes in rainfall. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are issues with how climate impacts rainfall, which impacts power generation uh, all the way down the line. Um, we can be policy neutral as scientists. But we need to be policy specific. It's not, it's, not, it's not enough just to say we have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. That's true. Um, but it, it, how you do this, how you can do this in a sensible way, how you can do this in ways that don't make other problems worse, uh, those are questions that we can help answer. Uh, but we can't determine, obviously, what policies actually, ever, what, what policies actually get um, adopted. So uh, to conclude. Um, Earth system models, and I haven't really shown you any, any big flashy graphics or anything, but, uh, but I could, I should have done that. Um, Earth system models, um, I think, can provide key input into uh, policy choices. We can do sector and policy specific scenarios, not just the generic business as usual kind of scenarios that the IPCC uh, has, has promoted. Uh, we can calculate the coherent responses of atmospheric chemistry, air pollution, particulates. Um, 
And what ends up happening when you do that is that you, you can build wider coalitions for any particular course of action because you can see that any particular course of action has implications that are much wider than just how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Um, we certainly need to do more work on, on building appropriate diagnostics, particularly when we start to get down to the regional level. Uh, what is it that, that people really are sensitive to? You know, you, nobody is really sensitive to the global mean temperature. You know, you're sensitive to rainfall in this watershed. You're sensitive to uh, you know, the number of days uh, above 30 degrees C in this locality. You know, you're sensitive to things that aren't necessarily the standard diagnostics that we always produce. Um, there's a lot of work that is happening, but that work is happening outside of the IPCC framework. And I think it's very important for, for stakeholders such as yourself to realize that the scientific community doesn't just speak through one mouthpiece, right? There's a lot of different work that's going on. There's a lot of different studies that are going on and there are lots of different perspectives that that if you can go out and look for them, uh, you might find to be uh, much more appropriate for, for your needs. Um, I think IPCC is very useful. It does a very good job of what it does. But, but as I said at the beginning, you know, IPCC is run by the scientists for the scientists. If you want science for policy, it's not necessarily the place that you'd want to go. Um, so uh, you know, to, to, to basically uh, conclude, um, scientists and policymakers, you know, we just need to talk, and and that goes to stakeholders too. So that's that's, that's for you. Okay, so that's it.